Um, David Coleman is going to be the first presenter of the year. Hopefully you've gotten the schedule. Uh, I've had virtually it all the way filled out through May of, of next year. Um, David, before you start, there are a number of people here who've never met you uh, and don't know who you are. So give a little bit of introduction before you go into your talk. Otherwise, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Hi, everybody. Good morning. My name is David Coleman. Uh, I've been asked to remind everyone to mute their uh, mute their audio. Be happy to take questions at the end um, on unmute at that time. Um, I am new faculty here, clinical faculty here at UW. I started, I just graduated from fellowship at Vanderbilt um, in, in June. And uh, I developed an interest in drug allergy at that time. And so my clinical interests are mostly in drug allergy. So I was hoping to chat with you about an overview of in some ways, the great things that are happening in the evaluation of drug allergy, and in other ways, the limitations that we have in evaluating drug, drug reactions. And so that is going to be the focus of my talk. I'm mostly gonna spend time on T-cell mediated reactions, um, but I have one case at the end that I just can't stand to not tell you about, uh, which is an IgE mediated case. And so that also helps me chat with, about those as well. And I want to let you know that I have nothing to disclose. So I have three learning objectives today is, and one is to increase familiarity with T cell mediated drug reactions. And, uh, and with that, we'll discuss different testing modalities and of course their limits. And then, um, and I'm, the way I'm going to discuss this is by talking to you about three cases that I saw as a fellow that I thought were really fascinating that helped me learn about some of of the uh, testing modalities that are available. And so I hope that you, as well as I did, will enjoy these three cases and will help increase our familiarity. So case one is a patient that I saw on the consult, the inpatient consult service at Vanderbilt. And I call it, I was feeling so well, what happened? So this is a 26 year old male. He didn't really access the health system too much but he has a history of poorly treated bipolar one. He was admitted two weeks ago to our, uh, to our hospital with shortness of breath, fevers, and a painful swollen lip. It was thought, though he didn't admit it, that he was uh, popping, which is um, you know, injection of, of drugs, um, often in a non-sterile way. And, uh, at, and he uh, was found also have a leukocytosis at that time. Um, they drained his swollen lip and he was found to have an MRSA lip abscess, which was drained by plastics. He also um, had associated MRSA bacteremia and septicemia with septic emboli to the lungs. A TEE was negative, so he didn't have endocarditis, but he did have all of these things as well. Um, he was planned for a th six week course of vancomycin per ID um, for empiric treatment of endocarditis in, in despite a negative uh, transesophageal uh, echocardiogram or TEE. Um, and so he, his, his course um, in regards to his MRSA was rather uncomplicated from the get-go. Um, once he started on vancomycin, his fever subsided about two to three days after an IND, uh, which was performed on day one of his hospitalization. Once less toxic, it became really apparent that his bipolar one and likely substance abuse was contributing um, in, a, in a really real way to his ability to get vancomycin. And he was, you know, they were worried that if he were to be discharged, um, that perhaps he would not be able to complete his course. Um, and so, um, and he became actively manic while in the hospital. And so about on hospital day five or six, he was started on um, quite a few medications, some of which you may recognize to be rather high risk for T-cell mediated reactions. Oxcarbazepine, olanzapine, buprenorphine, uh, naltrexone, trazodone, and ibuprofen for pain. So I saw him on hospital day 21. Um, and after not having a fever for about you know, 13, you know, I'm sorry, of, you know, about 18 days, he starts spiking fevers to 102 degrees. 
He had been afebrile otherwise for about two and a half weeks previously. Um, and he notes that even without anyone really prompting it, he's feeling like his glands are swollen. Um, he doesn't have any other localizing symptoms. Uh, and they're worried, you know, uh, when patients are in the hospital and they spike fevers, they get a, a pretty uh, routine workup, uh, which, which was a UA, uh, which was clean, blood cultures, which were negative uh, to date around the time I saw him, which was about two to three days or two days after his, uh, his fever started. And they're worried about, you know, his septic emboli and his lungs. So they uh, re-performed a CT chest, which just showed everything was stable. Um, and so I wanna talk you through his, his uh, histories. Um, he has a history of bipolar one. Um, uh, he had a motor vehicle accident in the past and had had some issues with his spine because of that. He denies IV drug abuse, but um, based on his, his lip abscess and his worry about skin popping, they were worried that he might have been not very forthcoming about that. His only surgical history was that he did have a fixation of the spine. Um, he has a pretty unusual social history. He fixes clocks, he farms, and he's a professional mover, and he denies any illicit drugs, um, although his opiates were positive on admission. So he was on quite a few medications when I, when I saw him on consults, um, most of which I had already discussed, but most of which are for pain um, or for, uh, or for um, you know, DVT prophylaxis, is an oxaparin. And, and or for sleep, the trazodone. So most of these medications are psych, psycho, psychiatric in, in origin, um, although he is also on the vancomycin as discussed for treatment of his MRSA associated infection. And so, and so I, when I, when I exa examined him, he was febrile um, with a Tmax of 102.2 and he was tacky to 120s at the time sinus tack. And the only thing that was really uh, remarkable on the exam was he had periorbital edema. His face just looked really puffy to me. And he had, um, he had generalized lymphadenopathy, anterior cervical, occipital, axillary, and inguinal nodes were enlarged at the time. And um, I didn't use his photo that was really classic, um, but, but his skin looked like this. And so, um, and then I took, take, taking you through some of his lab results, he did have a new, his leuco, he was initially had a leukocytosis on admission, which had briskly gone away, but now he has a new leukocytosis uh, to 13.3. And he had an absolute eosinophilia of 2,200. Um, he also had atypical lymphocytes on his, uh, on his diff as well uh, of 1,040. Those were the things that I found significant on a CBC with diff. And so this is as typical as I can get of dress syndrome. Um, so the interesting thing that I didn't know about dress syndrome is that it has a bit of a lag time. And so patients don't get dress syndrome in th three days often, unless they've you know, maybe had it before. It takes about two to eight weeks in order to develop, to develop of, of um, being on a medication in order to develop, to develop dress syndrome. And so this patient was on about uh, week three of his planned six week course of, of vancomycin, if that were the case. But he also had been on about uh, you know, two, two and a half weeks of a lot of psychogenic meds, which are also high risk as well, notably oxcarbazepine. And so the symptoms that are classic for dress are a milliboriform mil, eruption, um, which is present uh, over a good portion of the body surface area, at least 50%. Um, some patients will have a mucositis, which is non-erosive. And the all the patients that I've seen with dress syndrome have this sort of classic sort of doughy kind of facial edema um, that, that, um, that this patient had as well. Um, and oftentimes there's some scaly and purpura. Now the systemic symptoms that are cl classic are um, fever, um, in which this patient had, and lymphadenopathy. And so it's always important in a patient who you think might have dress syndrome uh, to do a very good lymph exam, uh, which was present in this patient. I get a couple of more labs than what are present in this box, and I'll talk to you about them in a minute. But the patients ought to have, um, but not always, in, in some rare cases they don't, but usually they will have some eosinophilia. So a differential is important. 
you'll also find atypical lymphocytes often on the differential as well. And so the patient did have that as well. I, um, and then you look for end organ dysfunction as well. And I'll talk to you in the next slides about what I get um, in, addition to, uh, in addition to liver function and also kidney function. Oftentimes you're gonna to wanna to look through a differential diagnosis of this. And I, at least at Vanderbilt, we're consulted not infrequently because sometimes stress syndrome can be a bit of a diagnostic conundrum for internists um, and pediatricians, but more, you know, more usually it's adults that are getting this. But, um, and so you know, looking for uh, viral or drug exanthem, um, severe eczema or psoriasis, erythr you know, erythrodermic type, um, uh, things on the differential which have erythroderma or um, early SJS to TEN. And so some the antibiotics that are commonly involved are vancomycin. Now, I want to point out vancomycin because it's not often on um, the internist radar that vancomycin can do anything other than um, anything other than so-called red man syndrome, otherwise known as non-IgE-mediated mast cell activation uh, via MRGPRX2. And so I want you to be aware that <laughs> Uh, we should be more, you know, we should, we should be acutely aware that vancomycin can cause this because oftentimes it's not even on ID physicians differentials either. Uh, so beta-lactams, tetracycline, rifampin, and anti-TB drugs are also uh, positive, uh, possible um, that are commonly involved. So testing, I'll talk about some of these in a minute, but patch testing has been um, sort of our uh, one tool toolbox um, Un until recently, until very, you know, not too long ago for workup of dress syndrome. And, you know, for patch testing, you really should wait until the patient is, is uh, like long after their dress syndrome. So about at least three to six months afterwards. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and then we'll talk about LA spot and HLA screening uh, later. And so, um, so dress syndrome, as we're well aware, is one of the, one of the subtypes of type, uh, type four mediated reaction. This is a T cell mediated reaction. And for reasons we don't quite understand, there's, a, um, there's an activation of a T cell. And in, in this case, the T cell um, skews in a type two response. So it secretes IL-4 and IL-5. Of course, IL-5, as we know, is really important for uh, differentiation and maturation of eosinophils. And so um, growth differentiation in eosinophils uh, differentiation of eosinophils. And so that's what creates the, uh, uh, the eosinophil. Now I've had some uh, t very tough uh, dress, syndrome, or dress syndrome cases where it's really tough to put the patient on long-term steroids. And so the question that we've gotten on consults not infrequently is, you know, should we put the patient on mepolizumab and IL or an IL-5 reagent, for example? And, you know, that has been done in case reports, but, you know, uh, it, it is, I mean, we would know that this is downstream of, of the effector cell that, that creates the dress syndrome, which is, which is the T cell. And so, um, so I, I, well, that's an interesting thought. I want to remind you that the T cell is the effector cell in this reaction. And so what else do I look at? Um, other, um, what, what else should be investigated? So hepatic function um, and renal function, those are the most commonly involved. Um, those are the most commonly involved end organs in dress syndrome. Thyroid function I often look at initially, but it's more common a later manifestation. Oftentimes dress is associated with autoimmune manifestations in later, you know, in, 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 uh, in, in, within the first year of after dress syndrome. And so I often follow these patients um, and, and look at, evaluate their thyroid function um, as, as they progress from their dress syndrome. Uh, the most common cause of uh, uh, death in dress syndrome is, uh, is myocarditis. And so I often on consults get an EKG and troponin um, and, and myositis is often involved. So I get a C CK. Now I had a really challenging dress syndrome patient last year who, um, who had vancomycin dress um, and they also had, um, they also, they all, the, the vancomycin was given for brain uh, after brain surgery. And so they, they just happened to have an omaya to, to be able to remove um, CS, uh, CSF fluid. And so in this patient, we, we found that they actually had eosinophils and atypical lymphs in their CSF, but obviously 
getting a CSF on every patient is, is not done, but should, you know, it, should you have it, it could be something that you could look at if, 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 you know, if they're worried about infection and are getting CSF fluid otherwise. Um, and so I wanna talk about a clinical tool that I, that I often use to evaluate patients with DRESS, um, and that's the Registar score. So the, the sensitivity and specificity, um, positive and negative predictive value, I wish they were known for this, but this is, this is, the, this is the scale that I often use um, in my consult notes when I, when I have a patient with suspected DRESS. Now, now I caution you that scores are not perfect, and so you, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't really hang your hat on this, but, uh, but, but it, can be, it can be supportive in patients that you are... Uh, that you're thinking may have dress syndrome. And so often a lot of the things that our patient have are, were positive here. So he had a fever, enlarged lymph nodes, atypical lymphs, eosinophilia, a skin rash. Um, you know, I didn't really talk about his end organ involvement because he didn't really have, he had a mild transaminitis that resolved even by the time I saw him. Um, and uh, at that time, he, I didn't know if he had resolved within 15 days, um, but we, they did look at other potential causes um, of this rash and didn't find any. So the patient had um, definitely a, a definitive case by the Registar score. So um, a, just a helpful, helpful tool for evaluating dress syndrome. And so what drug did it? Um, so usually, I mean, that's what everyone wants to know. And that's often what we are charged with answering. And uh, one thing to think about is what drugs are most culprit on his med list. And we sort of talked about it already. He was on vancomycin, but he was also on oxcarbazepine. Um, I, NSAIDs are um, an uh, underappreciated cause of, of T cell mediated reaction. So the ibuprofen was also, which he was scheduled, was also a, a thought. Um, and then, you know, thinking about what length of exposure is necessary for dress. And we sort of already talked about that. That is like a, a two day two to eight weeks um, lag time uh, of which, you know, all three of those drugs would have fit that timeline. And then HLA associations. And so why don't I talk about HLA associations? Well, there's three, um, the, there's three uh, main theories as to how T cell mediated reactions start. And, and there's a bit of data for all of these, but not a lot of data for any of these. And so, and so I will say that, you know, there is, some data that the drug can bind to um, the peptide in the uh, antigen presenting you know, cleft here and cause, uh, cause an activation where it otherwise wouldn't. Sometimes the antigen can react or can interact with the peptide and the HLA in order to do this. And sometimes it can do this in a non-covalent fashion. And so you know, my mentor, Elizabeth Phillips, has shown that um, in uh, allopurinol dress, um, that allopurinol can bind to the HLA and actually change the way it looks. And in doing that, um, you know, all of a sudden something that is, uh, all of a sudden, um, you know, uh, our immune system is recognizing us and that is what helps create allopurinol dress and allopurinol uh, SJST. Yeah. Um, and so uh, the, this is, these uh, hypotheses are potentially why um, HLAs are um, specific HLAs may be restricted in presenting this. And so there have already been a bit of data in doing this. So my mentor, Elizabeth Phillips, was the one that, to demonstrate uh, B HLA B5701 is associated with the back of your hypersensitivity syndrome. This is the, this is the most strongest associate, this is the strongest association that we have so far with a HLA causing a um, scar. Um, but there, uh, um, allopurinol, uh, carbamazepine, and some data that oxcarbazepine also is in the same, uh, this, the same HLA, uh, dapsone and flucloxacillin also have associations as well. But there's one that wasn't on that list uh, that has been shown, excuse me, has been shown since the, uh, that paper came out. And there have been a couple of papers since, um, and that is HLA A3201. And so HLA A3201, and in this paper, here is the visual, um, here's the visual abstract to this paper. So it actually helps, helps clarify it a little bit more. So about 7% of folks with European reg uh, ancestry carry this, this high risk allele. And about 20% of those who have vancomycin would uh, develop dress. 
And so in this paper, they looked at folks who, um, who got vancomycin dress or got vancomycin for a similar amount of time but didn't get dress, of which 80% of those were HLA A3201 positive and of which 0% of those were not HLA A3201 positive. And so, um, so this is, uh, and then this next part just looks at the percentage that are positive in, Vanco uh, in Vanderbilt's registry of gene, gene, gene registry, which is very robust there. And so um, we, um, they're, we're, they're actually developing a, a single risk, single, <laughs> single allele risk uh, assay. Um, and with this assay, they, they found um, that the patient is HLA-83201 positive. And so uh, our recommendations for this one were to avoid vancomycin, avoid oxcarbazepine and other aromatic anticonvulsants, um, avoid NSAIDs for now, um, and the patient just needed topical steroids for the rash at that time. Although, although that's not typical for dress, there was a, definitely a risk benefit discussion that had to be had because the patient had MRSA bacteremia. And because, because he was doing relatively well in terms of dress syndrome and that he only really had skin manifestations, his transaminitis had already improved by then, um, we, th we thought that topical steroids would be uh, sufficient to treat his dress. And so I, I uh, close this case um, saying that the patient high, has highly suspected vancomycin dress. And uh, I wish I could have followed up, but I, I have left since left Vanderbilt, but um, he was going to receive patch testing to vancomycin, oxcarbazepine and ibuprofen um, and to better clarify our hypothesis um, based on his high risk allele um, and uh, adequate exposure that it was vancomycin. So, this is a patient that came to us from the, in the outpatient side of things. And the question in the console was what caused his dress? So this is a 52 year old male with obesity, uh, um, obstruct, uh, obesity hyperventilation syndrome, type two diabetes. Um, he suffered a severe desquamating rash with a multi-week multi-hospital organization or, or uh, admission and was diagnosed by the dermatology team and patient with dress. Um, he presents to our drug allergy clinic wanting to know what antibiotic caused his dress. So he presented to the ED in a rural lo location distant from Vanderbilt with one day of lower quadrant colicky abdominal pain. He's still passing gas with no associated fevers and the C he had a CT scan which showed a pseudo obstruction. And he was started on so many medications, which made the consult very tough. He initially started on IV clindamycin and rocephin and was discharged. Um, but then for some reason, given a prescription for two other things, so cipro ciprofloxacin and flagyl. So there are four, four, uh, four antibiotics that he was given at the time. Um, the next day he took his first dose of cipro and flagyl. And that evening, so one day after he received the two IV medications of Rosefin and Clinda, um, and the, the, uh, the next day he took Cipro and Flagyl, he just generally felt unwell. He thought he might have a fever, but he didn't have a thermometer. Um, his abdominal pain subsided. He noticed red bumps on his arm and he presented to the local ED. He was found to be febrile to 101 with sinus tachy to the one teens. He noticed um, a a pinpoint itchy rash. And then everything, you know, our history got scarce. Um, we couldn't, there was not a lot of records from the outside hospital and the patient um, became encephalopathic. So he didn't really remember much. Uh, but what he did know is he started to desquamate from head to toe two days after starting a medication, about one to two days after starting a medication. He was admitted to the hospital, regional hospital for five days, then flown to our burn unit for, for treatment of this desquamating rash. Um, his CBC with diff, he was had a leukocytosis to 50, um, very toxic. Um, and he had, most of it was neutrophilic. So he had a absolute neutrophilic count of 46 point, or, you know, 46,000. Of note, um, he didn't have a single eosinophil, eosinophil on his diff, and he didn't have any uh, he didn't have any uh, atypical lymphocytes on his differential, um, and so that was interesting based on what his consult question was and his diagnosis was. 
um, and he did have a new transaminitis uh, to, um, that he didn't have prior. Um, we did some other investigation. Some other investigations were done by the provider team. We were not consulted as he uh, during his admission, um, and they were normal. Um, he had. I wish I. I wish I could show you his pictures because he really. He really was significant. Desquamation uh, of most of his body, though apparently he did have some primary lesions, uh, which were biopsied by dermatology. Um, and we're positive for corneal pustular dermatosis. Um, and so put, taken together with his, the timing of his reaction, the differential, which was not suggestive of dress syndrome, his registrar score, which was low, and his skin biopsy, which showed pustules, um, we didn't think it was dress at all, actually. We thought it was AGEP acute generalized exanthematous pustulosis, which is one of the severe, one of the scars. And this one is really interesting in that um, most T-cell reactions, you know, when we, when we talk about type four reactions, we say, you know, it usually takes about a week, but this one is brief. It usually takes about one to three days. Um, and the inflammation is neutrophilic. And I think what tripped up my, our, uh, our dermatology colleagues is that it's not usually associated with end organ dysfunction. So they were, they were really hanging their hat on the, the um, transaminitis that the patient had. Um, though in about 15% of cases, um, you can't have end organ dysfunction with, with AGEP. And antibiotics are also the most likely culprits, um, though can be caused by aspirin, aromatic anticonvulsants. And I had an excellent case in fellowship of a patient who had a brown recluse spider bite who ended up getting AGEP. Um, and so that should also be on the differential, though I don't think those are present in this area. But um, so AGEP, like I said, the, the hallmark, the interesting thing for, uh, that I thought was, was that in contrast to other T cell mediated reactions, it's very quick onset. Um, and generally, um, generally it doesn't present with desquamation either. So I think it, was, it very much was, but it can in about 10% of cases. Um, usually it presents with dozens of hundreds of pustules um, in sometimes uh, in the in uh, the flexural areas are are presented. So the usually if the patient were to have systemic symptoms, they will have high fever and some edema. Um, oftentimes there is a bit of eosinophilia, but oftentimes the main driver of this is neutrophilia. Um, and the differential diagnosis of this is other neutrophilic dermatoses such as pustular psoriasis. Um, but also can be uh, bullous and patigo um, or, dress syndrome, or can be dress syndrome um, as sometimes these T cell mediated reactions are not quite so clear cut. Um, and so in this case, um, for some reason that we don't understand, there's an accident in T cell presentation, uh, which is the, the main hypothesis as to how these reactions get started. And the T cell is activated and for reasons why, that we don't quite understand, um, the T cells um, don't themselves secrete CXCL8, otherwise known as IL8, but, but there, is a, um, there is an increased CXCL8, otherwise known as IL8, which um, as you know, is very important in, in neutrophil, um, neutrophil production. And so um, the patients end up, instead of dress syndrome, for example, getting AGEP. And so I wanna talk a little bit about um, how we test and when to test, but I want to let you know it's very limited in the United States, and you know there are no really FDA-approved patches or compounds, and so a lot of this is based on expert opinion. Hmm. There we go. Okay. Um, so, so this is a. I thought this was a really helpful slide in helping us me understand between patch tests, prick tests, and intradermal tests what I might do based on the reaction, and so. Um, patch testing has been more the mainstay. Um, you know, it's been used more, more in the past, but people are starting in some cases to use prick tests and intradermal tests for evaluation of T cell mediated reactions. Um, for maculopapular exanthems, this can be useful, um, but you know, oftentimes it might be more useful to just give them a dose and see if they, we can get rid of that label. Um, but you know, there are some patients who have 
who are very bothered by and get repeated um, macular papular exanthems. Um, and in that case, it would be maybe important to do patch testing or intradermal testing to better understand um, what's going on here. Uh, I'm going to move down to AGEP. I'm going to focus on AGEP dress and SJSTEN um, and macular papular rash, and the rest will be in my, in my slides. So patch tests ha for AGEP have been useful, and it can the sensitivity is up to 60%, um, so not great. Um, and intradermal tests have, have been used in the past and can be potentially useful. Dress syndrome is uh, patch tests are useful, um, it can be positive in up to 30 to 60% of cases. But the important thing about dress syndrome is you should probably do this. You should wait, you know, at least, you know, sometimes three, but probably six months after all of the sequelae and, and rash goes away. Um, part of which being that in, in most cases of dress, they're on high dose steroids. And so as you understand, um, you know, you can't, you can't do testing on high dose steroids. Um, and so, um, but Prick tests um, can be positive and uh, in, uh, delayed intradermal testing. Um, unfortunately, the safety of which is, is not known at this time, although I, I was, you know, I, we did this routinely at Vanderbilt, but it's, I feel like there's not enough data to show that um, uh, the safety of this. And as you know, it's a, delay, it's a delayed thing. And so, um, you know, you're not looking at what happens 15 to 20 minutes after you place the test. You're looking at what happens, you know, six hours to 20 to 48 hours after the test was placed. Now I want, and I think we're all getting excited about these tests, but um, I want to let you know. So sometimes people think maybe I should do this for SJSTEN. Well, right now it's contra, uh, uh, prick tests and intradermal tests are contraindicated for this condition. And, and uh, you can do patch testing but uh, it has the lowest sensitivity of all of this. And so I feel like our toolbox, is, toolbox in terms of placing tests for SJSTEN is very limited at this time. <clears throat> so we did skin testing for him. And unfortunately, you know, he lives far away and, <laughs> and had only had a flip phone. <laughs> we sh after that, we started asking our patients, do you have a, a, not any, something other than a flip phone? But uh, we did testing to penicillins. We did Zos in here. Uh, we did ceftriaxone. We did Motrin. We did ciprofloxacin. This is Flagyl down here. I wish these were better in frame, but this is a patient taken. Um, but what you can see here is that clindamycin at about 24 hours had a blistering vis you know, vesicular rash at both of the concentrations of clindamycin that we use, uh, which is consistent with um, a T-cell mediated reaction to clindamycin. And so the, the, final, the final diagnosis is AGEP um, secondary to clindamycin. And so I do have plenty of time, going a little bit faster than I thought I would, um, to talk to you about this real interesting, um, interesting case of a 20, 12, uh, 20 year old male with a tooth abscess. So I said day negative four. So this was, so four days prior to like the main event that happened. Uh, he complains of a couple days of dental pain he otherwise wasn't very um, toxic appearing. He didn't have a fever. He didn't have drooling, muffled voice, or any other symptoms that might make you worried he had an abscess or you know, systemic symptoms. Um, he presented to his medicine cabinet uh, where his mom had some expired amoxicillin in the medicine cabinet. And he took an unknown amount of that expired amoxicillin. Um, and about one hour later, um, he developed red feet, blurry vision, vomiting, and noticed that his heart rate was high about one hour after taking amoxicillin. He presented to the emergency room. Um, and at the emergency room, his heart rate and his, you know, sort of soft blood pressures were attributed to sepsis secondary to dental abscess, though he didn't have any symptoms of dental abscess at the time. He was given fluids, started on clindamycin, watched overnight, and discharged without incident on PO clinda. Four days later, he did well on the clinda. He went to his oral surgeon. He was found to have a tooth abscess, um, and he was induced with propofol, versed, and fentanyl. He was doing okay, and then he was given unison. Minutes later, after the infusion, he was found to be cyanotic. 911 was called. He was intubated in the OMFS office. He lost the pulse. 
BLS was this initiated. Um, he, en route to Vanderbilt, he received 15 minutes of chest compression and three rounds of epi. Uh, his, he was asystolic uh, to pulseless electrical activity to sinus tack. And at that point, they recognized that this was probably an allergic reaction. Uh, like, uh, and so he was ad admitted to the MICU on a norepi and epi drift, a drip with the diagnosis of presumed allergic reaction. He had known past, no known past medical and surgical histories. Uh, he was otherwise on no medications prior to the uh, incident, otherwise had no known medication allergies prior to the incident. Um, and so I think we all can recognize that this likely was a um, uh, allergic reaction, probably to the amoxicillin and then the unison. And so, um, so one of the things that I always try to help folks remember when they start working with beta-lactam allergies is to understand the structure. In medical school, we were, we were taught that this beta-lactam ring was an you know an all encompass you know an all encompassing you know the the antibody that is made to true allergies binds to this beta lactam ring, which which negates you from having all beta lactams other than S and M. Well, obviously, <clears throat> most of us know that that's not the case. That some patients are allergic to the the penicillin or cephalosporin backbone, and some patients are allergic to the R1 chain. So penicillins have an R1 just one R chain, which makes them different from each other. Encephalosporins have two R chains, of which the R1 is analogous to the single R of the penicillins. And so the cross-reactivity is much lower than the 10% we were taught in medical school. And I just put this here to show you that there are many papers, this is one of them, where you can look and find which Rs are either nearly similar or structurally the same um, between different cephalosporins or, or different beta-lactam medications. And so this is what I use routinely when evaluating. And so this patient um, came to our clinic one month later after his incident. And initially um, he was uh, skin tested to uh, prepen, um, cefazolin, or sorry, ceftriaxone, cefazolin. Um, and then uh, here's, here's uh, ampicillin penicillin G at different at three different concentrations. And as you note that his ampicillin was positive on prick testing, we moved on to intradermal testing with all the rest of these. And um, he was found to be positive to penic all of prepen, penicillin G at two different concentrations. This is our, and I know no one really likes this here because from last year when I told this, this is our minor determinant factor. This is made, um, I, uh, this is made by, uh, you know, uh, this is made from penicillin G, um, and here's ceftriaxone or and cefazolin. Um, and as you know, this is really interesting because I feel like a lot of our education lately is on, it's the R chain, it's the R chain, it's the R chain. But in this patient, he actually was um, the, he was positive to the penicillin backbone. At least this is what is um, suggested by his, uh, uh, by, by his testing here. And so what concentration do I use? Well, nothing felt so much like Christmas morning as a physician than this practice parameter that came out last, last month. So this is a new drug allergy practice parameter that I would love to uh, give your attention to. It's about 60 pages long. It's kind of like the <laughs> Harry Potter potions book in that it's, it, it, it helps you in almost every drug um, with evaluation of drug allergy. And so this is, this is a great resource to go to if, you're, if you want a place to start. And you know, um, things other than prepen have not been vetted as much as, as I would hope they would, but all of this is based on expert opinion and what the drug aller allergy experts are using. Once this came out, I looked at what we were doing and I was very happy that the concentrations that are in these practice parameters are, are either nearly identical or identical to what is in the practice, to what we're doing here at UW. So that made me very happy. Um, and, and there's no standardization or FDA approval of drugs that are prepen. And so that's something you should know. But cases like this make me a believer. They, you know, I, I've, used those, I've used those very same reagents on hundreds of patients. They've almost never been positive, but a case where it ought to have been, it's positive. And so that makes me feel really good that, that 
this we're doing what they're doing. So initially, in the initially we had recommended avoiding penicillins, obviously, and um, we gave him uh, cefuroxime, which does not have the R chain that's shared by amino penicillins and aminocephalosporins. And because he tolerated it, we showed that he could tolerate a cephalosporin backbone. And so we had asked, we had said it was okay to do all cephalosporins other than the aminocephalosporins. Aminocephalosporins are named that because they share the same R group with amino penicillins, which is ampicillin and augmentin. Um, and so, and then we brought him back to clinic and he, he actually tolerated Keflex, um, which does share the same R group as, the, as um, ampicillin and amoxicillin, which he is allergic to. And so that is really interesting, further, further demonstrating that it was a um, penicillin backbone problem and not an amino, um, you know, amino beta lactam uh, R problem. And so uh, we're, it's really interesting. It, we, learn, we have learned, you know, there, we've known for some time now that patients lose IgE mediated uh, allergy at a rate of about 10% per year. And so he will come back on a yearly basis to repeat skin testing. Um, is sort of more like a research protocol to better understand at about what time timing, um, you know, he will uh, potentially lose this skin testing. And so with that, I, I went a lot faster than what I what I wanted to. Um, but I'm very happy to answer questions about what you know these three cases, my experiences with uh, testing and evaluation of drug allergies, um, or anything else that that you might um, you might have uh, to talk about that I can. I can better clarify about my talk today. Thanks so much. And the word of the day is drugs. Uh, David, do you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. So uh, this is Len Altman. So I trained, of course, 50 years ago. There was no disease called dress 50 years ago. Um, and I'm wondering, did it exist and we didn't know what it was? Did we not use the drugs that incited it? Um, what, uh, what if anything has changed other than our knowledge that there is such a disease and we just weren't smart enough to even know what was going on? Yeah, that's a very good question. I, I think that, well, you know, uh, and I, I'm not very, you know, I'm not as in, uh, knowledgeable about what medications were and weren't used 50 years ago. But what I'll say is that, you know, a lot of the, well, you know, early beta lactams can cause dress. Uh, they're less likely to than, um, say, vancomycin or, you know, psychiatric, psychogenic medications. And so I think, I think you hit the nail right on the head um, that, there, that there are two reasons why I often see that dress syndrome um, was not picked up in that um, you know, maybe it was that the medications that were used 50 years ago were not um, so, so likely culprit to cause dress. But I really do think that dress is a diagnostic conundrum of sort. So I think it's often, it often needs to be pretty blatant um, to be caught right away. And I've saw maybe two or three cases in fellowship of patients who were basically, um, you know, once they were transferred to Vanderbilt, there was nothing we could do because they, it had been missed for so long. And so, um, you know, I, I think I think part of it is that dress is remains even though we know about it a diagnostic conundrum. That maybe that's another reason why it wasn't as caught 50 years ago. Hey, David, this is Matt. Uh, great talk. Um, and so we, along the lines of dress, that HLA A3201 finding uh, is is great. Uh, I was not aware of that paper. So thank you for sharing it. That's got to be the, the greatest advance in the field of dress in the last five years or more. Um, I'm curious about that. So it looks from the small sample size that, that you guys had, you know, that's quite um, uh, sensitive and highly specific. I mean, when are we at the point or is Emily doing this of screening before vancomycin the same way that we do with a back of your hypersensitivity with the HLA B allele that's associated there. Um, are they working on that? Is there a rapid test that could be employed, you know, or is it too rare a condition and too rare an allele um, to have uh, pre-screening be worthwhile? So um, the number needed to treat for this is about 70. And so they are working at Vanderbilt on a single, single allele um, you know, a single allele test for HLA A3201. I think what's really interesting is that 
you know, in, in patients who are expected to be on vancomycin for long term, I, I, I know that it is, it is Vanderbilt's interest in, in um, pushing that, patient, that uh, clinicians consider um, this, this test in patients who are going to be on it for long term. We had a really interesting case of a patient who had vancomycin or vancomycin dress after stem cell transplant. And as you know, HLA typing is well known prior to transplant. And so they had HLA A3201 and that could have been prevented. And so education um, and uh, further uh, up escalation of this um, is, is, is what I think uh, my mentors are hoping to do in the next coming years, if that answers your question. Yeah. No, it does. That's great. And it's interesting, you know, I think the back of your story probably predates both of us a little bit. Um, but obviously, that was extremely successful. Uh, and I guess, you know, it was a narrow audience and that you only really had to approach HIV, you know, ID docs. Um, and it, whereas everybody uses vancomycin in, to some degree, but certainly if that could be rolled out, it, it seems great. I mean, I guess along the same lines, then, um, <clears throat> That is that is a, a pretty striking association, especially if they've actually done any you know crystallography or understanding of the the binding in the HLA pocket. Um, you know, we see dress here quite a lot, um, generally in a sort of Asian Pacific uh, ethnicity, uh, which is I believe most common for dress. So I'm wondering if they're looking in you know other populations, other HLA types for sort of the same molecular story. I, I I imagine they would. But that's you know that's uh, Elizabeth's kind of. Uh, <laughs> she doesn't sleep and she always works on this and that's her that's her dream and so I know I know they're continuing to look for associations. Um, there is an association that's not as strong in the Asian population. I think it's fifteen oh. I I, I wouldn't want to. Oh no, it's twenty three oh one. It's H L A A twenty three. Yeah. Um, uh, but um, but it's not as strong of association as the um, you know the European population thirty two oh one. I mean, just a lot to, to push that further. So we, we see a surprisingly high number of cases here. Um, I mean, in my first years, I got consulted several times a year for dress. Um, and so if there's interest in collaboration, you know, we could get patient data, get, you know, HLA typing or whatever to sh share with them. You know, that might be something worth pursuing. Um, <clears throat> sometimes they go to dermatology, sometimes they go to us, sometimes they go to both. But uh, just you know, thinking about that as a, a potential collaboration. Yeah, I would love to uh, collaborate with them. That would be that would be great. David, for there are a lot of people listening who um, who are not even clinicians. Could you just, on a simple level, explain to them the ethnicity relationship? You know, what what ethnic groups are more prone and why? Uh, so. Basically, um, you know, HLA is a, is a molecule that helps the immune system teach us uh, who that we're us and, and not someone else. So I, I'm me and I'm not Len Allman. <laughs> so um, because of that, you know, and there are, there's, there's different HLA molecules and there's, and there's different, um, you know, subtypes of all those molecules. And so what we're beginning to understand is that in a lot of these T cell mediated reactions, because it's an immune mistake in antigen presentation between, you know, say dendritic cells and the T cells, that the HLA um, is restricted, and that, um, in that, in in many of these cases, a, a, a specific HLA subtype is necessary to create um, the T, you know, in order to create the milieu to have the uh, the T cell mediated reaction happen. And so different alleles uh, are, are more or less risky than others. And so because of that, you know, um, different HLAs are more common, subtypes are more common in different ethnicities. And so that is why, you know, as Matt and I were just discussing that, you know, for example, HLA 3201 is more common in folks of Caucasian, European descent and HLA tw uh, 23, 2301 is more common in Asian descent. And so that may be, uh, you know, the frequency by which we see these high risk alleles is different in different races and ethnicities. And so that's why, that's why different uh, dress, um, di different uh, uh, T cell mediated reactions are at different frequencies based on the ethnicity. Uh, 
others with questions? Now you generalize and just call these T cell reactions, but we have lots of subtypes of T cells and we have two major classes of HLA. Yes, sir. Uh, you wanna expand more on that? Sure, yeah. So, you know, t uh, here, let me go back to, uh, here, why don't I not hurt your eyes and I will go back to this, this one here. Okay. So um, there are many T-cell re mediated reactions, but we're starting to break down those T-cell mediated reactions. Um, Gel and Coombs uh, developed the first, um, you know, uh, they didn't develop. They, they, they're, they are the, um, their classification of allergic reactions are often the foundation by which we describe t uh, allergic reactions to each other, but they're not, um, they oftentimes are not specific enough. And so, especially in the T cell mediated reactions or otherwise known as type four reactions. And there have been different subclasses uh, to, to better uh, describe these. And so, um, so um, in, in type four A, um, the T cell is activated and, and, and uh, in, uh, it skews the T helper cell, otherwise known as a CD4 cell, skews on a, uh, to, to a type one response. So uh, it helps secretion of interferon gamma. This interferon gamma, of course, is, is uh, uh, immensely important for activation of macrophages. And so because of that, um, the difference, uh, the, uh, the response that you see is often um, the tissue damage associated with macrophage activation. And so this is, um, this is the hallmark cases for this are your, um, your quote, quote, drug rash, otherwise known as your sort of delayed, you know, uh, type four rash, otherwise, um, otherwise could be contact dermatitis or the reaction that some people get when they get their uh, TB test. We talked a little bit about dress syndrome and how dress syndrome skews the CD4 cell skews to a type two response, um, secreting type two cytokines, um, IL-4, IL-5, and then, you know, IL-13 is really important for type two as well. Um, and uh, that creates, um, you know, eosinof uh, eosinophils and otherwise, you know, type two allergic inflammation. Um, and then there's type four, and then that, that of course is uh, dress syndrome. Um, and in type four C, the cytotoxic T cell is activated and, uh, you know, via perforin and granzyme um, causes tissue destruction of, of the skin and, and internal organs. And of course, that lead, the, the phenotype which uh, is exuded by that response is SJSTEN or, or, or other, otherwise uh, fixed drug, drug eruption. Um, and then I talked earlier about AGEP. AGEP is um, uh, when, when for reasons we don't quite understand, um, CXCL8, otherwise known as IL8, and GMCSF, which are intimately important for neutrophils are, are um, not secreted by the T cell because they don't secrete those things, but, but are activated and thus secreted um, and create in, increased neutrophils in the phenotype of which uh, is AGEP. Um, as far as, as, far as uh, and so that, that is the subtypes of type four responses. In the type David, four, just, uh, the last one, are those TH17 cells? So yes, those are Th17 cells. Th17 cells secrete uh, IL17 A and F. IL17 A and uh, especially IL17 A is uh, is acts on the epithelial or endothelial or I'm sorry epithelial cells, uh, and that is what is uh, involved in secreting IL8, otherwise known as CXCL8, uh, which increases neutrophils. Well, thank you. That was a brilliant talk. Thank you very much. And obviously everybody in the community uh, should be aware that we have a new expert here to, to, to help solve these complex drug reactions. So I welcome any other questions. David, Hi, just uh, another comment. Or, go ahead. Go ahead, Matt. This is Vanilla here. Go ahead. Well, I just had a quick question on the drug allergy practice parameters. Um, so for one, it's really great if that, that that's out because I've been talking to David Kahn and Mariana for years and they keep saying, well, soon, soon. So I guess it maybe wasn't announced because we didn't have quad AI this year. I can't actually find it on, um, 
online. Uh, it's not on Quad AI yet. Could you share it? Because I think, I mean, just for the community and everybody, it's really important we use that because standardization in this field, I feel like it's something that we really need. Um, and, you know, that, that document, even the older one, was so important towards the level of standardization. So I'm um, just being aware of it and making sure everybody has access to it. I will, sh I will share it to everybody. Um, you know, I will, I will uh, send it to, uh, you know, Sonia to share it with the group. But Great. I have it, I'm, I hope you can see it on my screen now. I, it's like on my, it's on my laptop. Cause it's, you know, it's like one of my, you know, uh, now my foundation here, but it is, I mean, it is lengthy. And if you want to know about something, it's probably in here, at least what the field thinks about it right now, it's in here. The physical printed copy already came out if you still get subscriptions to the actual magazine. Yeah, that looks like a good, great improvement to have the table and everything in it. That was all lacking in the 2010 version. Oh yeah, this is, I mean, this this is night and day. Um, I mean, this this is this is just excellent. Um, <laughs> it was like, like I said, it was like Christmas morning. It was, it was, it was so good. <laughs> and hi, hi, there. This is Vinod Doraswamy, one of the practicing allergists in the community. Thanks for you know for a wonderful talk, um, Matt. Real quick, I think I found you know again online too. You can find the practice parameter if you actually you know it's there and you know the Jackie in practice. You know you're able to download it. You know, so it's there online. You can search it. That's great. Uh, the, question, the question I had, um, you know, was not specifically dress, but you know, you know, the common scenario where in practicing allergy, we see either you know, like a isolated or a new onset angioedema, and it's not none of the usual conventional, you know, triggers that you've been ruled out, right? In the ACE or you know, NSAIDs and things like that, and. It so happens to be in a patient where you know there is mild increase in eosinophils. It's not to the level of um, you know, you, and there's no other changes. There's some definite, there's some baseline before where there is no eosinophils and there is a perceptible increase in eosinophils around the time of the event. You know how critical or how useful is you know trying to figure out in terms of either patch testing or. Um, you know, either intradermal testing or scratch testing for trying to you know dig through the some of the either common medicines there is or you know or supplements to try to understand you know there's a definite yes like response this is this an allergic response to some of the things they are started taking at the time yeah that's a great question i think it goes back to um you know for you know the way i always think about it is you know is this a is this a drug that's likely to cause stress does the timing by which the patient started the medication um you know, fit with dress syndrome, and then do the you know does the phys history, physical exam, and lab lab findings sort of suggest that? And so, so starting off, you know, does the history suggest that? You know, that's you know maybe. Um, that, you know, I don't know about the timing. So the timing is always really important. And so, you know, it's not very common for patients to get dressed like three you know three after three years of being on lisinopril for example you know they, it really is like a very focused kind of sort of time frame but i think it would be you know if you're if you're stuck and you're you're concerned about it it wouldn't be the wrong answer to uh, discontinue the medication and and consider testing um now uh now i think i what i'll say is that isolated angioedema you know doesn't sound uh a lot like dress syndrome but but I think I think in in the case of like angioedema with a little bit of eosinophilia, it wouldn't be the wrong answer to discontinue it and just empirically see um, what the eosinophils do, and then you, you know you can consider testing when they're off the medication if 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 it's suggestive I guess if that makes sense. Um, you know, right? You know, meaning the scenario is referring to is you know there's no obvious medicine, right? You know, not the typical medicine. It's like some combination of uh, whatever supplements and other things they're taking you know the utility of trying to I'm trying to figure out which you know test you know is testing for some of those going to be helpful in that in that instance it may be really hard to figure out which they started when they started some of the some of the supplements so if it's something clear cut then maybe it'll be pretty obvious to say let's stop that yeah i and i think um as far as you know supplements are concerned you know um and uh 
I, I think, I mean, I think that that might be helpful. One thing that I like to use, and uh, the other thing that sometimes I consider is excipients. So, you know, filler drugs in, in drugs have, have been shown to be, in some cases, right. allergenic. Um, and so one, one, uh, one tool I use uh, very frequently is NIH Daily Med. I just search NIH Daily Med. And you can look at all of the excipients and in the drugs in order to better understand kind of like what, what what's uh, what's hidden inside of them. Um, you know, we shoot we showed at Vanderbilt that polysorbates um, uh, uh, and polyethylene glycol in rare cases can be allergic. Right. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, patients are anaphylaxing the bowel prep, for example, um, and and so sometimes I do testing. Uh, to better elucidate whether you know polysorbates are the issue because they're in steroids, they're in a lot of things, for example, you know. So, um, uh, so I do sometimes steroid testing to better understand, you know, if they've had because there's I have a good testing strategy um, to look at polysorbates in in uh, steroids, for example. And that's a very wonderful, you know, you know, I think segue. I just had a sec follow up question to that. You know, I think I'm sure many practicing allergists sometimes see our patients with concerns for corn related product, you know, in drug, you know, in, in, in our, as fillers or derivatives of corn as being reactive. You know, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I, uh, I, w I wish I had really uh, good thoughts on that, but I'll have to read more into it. And, but I think, I mean, it has been shown that in some cases, patients who are allergic to foods have had issues with, uh, have had issues with, with drugs. You know, for example, I saw, you know, a couple of alpha gal patients uh, down south who had had issues with Creon, for example, uh, you know, which is, uh, uh, and so I, I don't, I don't think it's beyond the reasonable question, but I, I wish I had a, a better, I wish I had a more intelligent answer for that particular question. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks for the, uh, answering your questions. I appreciate it. Thanks for the talk. All right, David, thanks again. I think um, uh, we'll uh, have to move on. I think we have a faculty meeting and board review. And um, glad you got to introduce yourself and your expertise to the broader community. Thanks again. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you, David. It was a great talk.